So what I would like to talk about tonight is letting go of judgment, okay, the, po the possibility <coughs> for us all to be free of the judging mind, free from the judging mind. So judgment, uh, I think, if one uh, is a sensitive human being and one aspires towards that, one realizes that this is quite a common thing. It's quite common. One sees it in oneself and one sees it in others. Judging. Judging oneself, judging others, judging anything. Not only does one see how common it is, one sees the pain associated with it. So judging mind is not really a happy mind. Sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, it's true that when we're judging others, we may actually enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> if we're really honest. <laughs> but just to be clear, this is what the Buddha keeps saying, what leads to happiness, what does not lead to happiness. Judging mind does not lead to a very deep or fulfilling or lasting happiness. Okay. Actually, judgment is the thief of happiness. It's the thief of happiness and it's the thief of peace. Almost always though, uh, we sense that judging ourself is painful and that we can see uh, it blocks our creativity. You know, how often in our life have we tried maybe to write a poem or a painting and we end up just uh, screwing up the paper and throwing it out or something often because judgment has come in. I'm useless, I have no talent, I'm, I'm crap, you know. What's happening? The judgment is, is, is coming and it's blocking the creative expression, it's blocking the, the flowering of the human being, the opening of the human being. And in a way, there's a real, there's a real sadness in that, there's a real tragedy in that. When we come to meditation practice, and then we, we find the same thing there. The judging mind comes in. How am I doing? You know. uh, Dharma practice, this practice needs passion. Okay? And if you're around for a while in these, you know, this kind of uh, practice, you realize it takes, I mean, you, can, you already know, it takes a lot of work. And that work, if it comes from passion, if it comes from love, uh, from love of the Dharma, love of exploration, it has energy in it and it can take you very far through all the ups and downs and difficulties. Judgment of ourselves um, strangles that passion and we need that passion for practice. We need to have, in a way, a heart that's just wanting to practice, loves, loves to explore, on fire a little bit even. So it's important to see practice is not about being, um, you know, super meditative, super concentrated, or making ourselves better or perfect people. Okay, it's not about perfecting oneself. It's about freedom. It's about freedom, and they are different things. The point of practice is freedom. It's not about uh, correcting all my faults. So in, in English, uh, we can make a distinction between two words. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if this is correct with the dictionary or whatever, but just, just to illustrate something. We can talk about judgment, and we can talk about something called discernment. So I don't actually know if there are two words in Finnish, but um, I'll, I'll try and explain what I mean. Uh, Discernment is when we just are clear what's helpful, what's working, what's uh, useful, and what's not. So it's, it's quite simple. In a way, it's quite a neutral just, oh, I see, this is helpful, this is not. So, uh, someone a little while ago <laughs> asked me what I thought about taking LSD <laughs> in the spiritual path. And I don't actually think that it's that useful in a, in the long term. So it's just just to be clear, you know, that's discernment. Okay. Um, 
Well, we can see love is good, it's helpful. We want to cultivate that. It leads to my happiness. It doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't create harm for others. Whereas if I cultivate anger, irritability, etc., I can discern this actually is not, is not helpful to me, it's not helpful to other people. There's quite a neutral, just clarity about what's needed. So any, anyone who's been involved, uh, or actually I should make the distinction, so that's discernment, and then judgment is when this, again, when the self gets wrapped up about in that. So instead of saying this or that is helpful or not helpful, what happens is a judgment gets made about self, myself or another self, another. I am useless, I am a failure, I am stupid, you are an idiot, you are an ang angry person, you, me, you, me, I, watch out, those words, they're, they're loaded, you know. So judgment is when the self has, has got hold of this and made it more about the self than about just simple, uh, simple what's useful, what's not, what's helpful, what's not. So I don't know, are there two words in Finnish for that? Could you? Doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, in discernment too, there's value involved. So we would say we're valuing, we value calmness, we value love, we value uh, patience, but we're not making so much ego in it. Do you, do you understand the difference? It doesn't matter if there's not a word, but I just want to be clear that the, the difference is... <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> So at one point, the Buddha, when, <laughs> when he was practicing, uh, before he was enlightened, it occurred to him one day, what if I divide my thoughts into two camps? One camp is that which I, can, I am sure is helpful to me and helpful to others. So thoughts of metta, of loving kindness, thoughts of uh, simplicity, thoughts of... Um, concentration, that kind of thing. Uh, that I can be sure is good. And what if I then make this division and decide to cultivate what's helpful and let go of what's not helpful? What he didn't say is, what if I then, uh, you know, start judging myself about it? Okay. <laughs> if he had done that, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today, because it would just be the story of another neurosis would just be the story of another kind of person getting upset about themselves. So that potentially was quite a key point in the Buddha's journey. To act, and it's, it was a moment of discernment, of clearly making a difference. And you can see, if, if any of you have been involved in like um, creative or artistic projects that go over a period of time, you know, over hours or days or, or months or even years, uh, there's a lot of discernment that goes into the process. You know, if you're writing a novel, hmm, that passage should maybe go earlier in the book, or that's not quite, I shouldn't really say that right now, or that word doesn't really fit, or if you're, you know, writing a symphony or whatever. A lot of discernment goes in, but once the self gets in there, then, then the problems start. Then the problems start. So discernment in itself is not a problem. It's, it's when the self gets wrapped up in it. Myself or another self. So, we find ourselves with a lot of judgment, uh, or a little judgment, or, and then we hear the teachings, and we hear about mindfulness, and we think, great, all I need to do is notice this judgment, and I notice it, and I notice it over and over. And there, are some, there is some power to that. There is some power. I just, I'm just noticing the habit of judging over and over. But I don't know if mindfulness alone is enough, always. And sometimes we can be mindful, but we're going to have to be mindful for a very, 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 very long time. Uh, m maybe longer than we're alive. <laughs> so, 
Uh, mindfulness alone doesn't always have the power. And sometimes with, with something like the judging mind, you actually need to challenge it in quite direct ways, sometimes. So there are, there are a few, uh, I'd like to go into this a little bit, there are a few ways to, to judge, to, uh, to, to challenge it. So one way is, is for example, taking this situation here. Uh, we are in silence together, and so we see others practicing with us, and the mind very quickly, very you know, very normal almost for the mind to just start making judgments about another person. Oh, they are a really good meditator. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, they're not really making it. <laughs> not like me, you know. And is is natural or whatever or, or the way they eat or how much food they take whatever you know anything judgment will grab hold of anything absolutely anything it's it has no uh, no shame judgment you just take hold of anything but because of the silence we actually don't know we know very little about what's actually going on with other people uh, even if we're in the group together we only know a little bit about their life we don't know uh, what has happened to them recently what um, what their work situation is, or their health, you know, they may have found out something about their health, or um, a piece of news about, about something recently. We have no idea what's going on for people right now, in the recent past, or in the, far, in the distant past. And somehow, the, judg the judgment just comes in automatically, and we, we need to remind ourselves that we know very little about uh, another person's situation. We can see that here, and it's obvious because of the silence, but it's also obvious in our lives, or it's, uh, we should make it obvious to ourselves, we should remind ourselves. Oftentimes, we're, you know, we meet people and we, we don't know that much about what's going on for them. So to use the reflective mind and reflect on this, remind oneself of this. The Buddha also talks about something uh, a strategy, uh, he calls it remaining, it sounds funny even in English, but remaining percipient of the positive qualities. So, what does that mean? It means um, when there's judgment of another person, we, we just see that negative thing. We think that thing that we're judging, we just see it over and over. So the Buddha is saying, take your mind, take it off that, and put it onto their positive qualities. Just keep and keep it there. Find something that that you can appreciate about that person, some goodness or some quality that's lovely, and keep the mind there. Keep the mind there. Keep finding them. So here, you know, if you find it going on, um, just to reflect, the person is here. That's already saying something. They sh they showed up. They're s you know they're coming to the uh, they're doing the practice through all the difficulties, and we all know what the difficulties are of practice. And that is something that we can appreciate in another human being. So everyone's keeping the form, everyone's supporting each other. To, to keep, keep the mind um, in touch with what's positive. So it d because when there's judgment of another, it, it becomes obsessed with the negative, and it's just seeing the negative over and over. So you really have to, have to put it on the positive and keep it there. third uh, possibility to actually get in touch with the pain of the judging mind that I talked about. So just, just to pay attention, in the moment of judging another person, how do I actually feel? How do I actually feel? And if we just have a little bit of sensitivity and space around it, we go into it a little bit, it doesn't feel very good. It doesn't feel very good. There's actually suffering there. We are suffering. Uh, and can we then touch our own suffering, that suffering of, of judging, of the habit of judging, can we touch it with kindness? And here we are in this moment and we've uncovered some suffering because we are judging another person. Can we then just feel that suffering and meet it with, with compassion, with kindness? So not even thinking about the other person uh, right then, but just touching that suffering, realizing the suffering involved in, in judging.
There's another little trick which I'm actually quite fond of. It's from um, Shanti Deva, which is a very uh, famous uh, Indian uh, sage, I suppose, from I think the eighth century. And actually, this is an adaptation of something he said. So, if you find yourself judging someone else, say, let's, it could be in any situation, let's take this, this uh, situation here. You find yourself judging someone, oh. Then imagine a third person. And this person has been uh, living in a hole in the ground in, in the Burmese jungle for the last 45 years meditating 23 and a half hours a day <laughs> and they know how to meditate <laughs> and they come here <laughs> and that you're judging this other person and they look at you and they think <laughs> if you imagine this third person you begin to think the, the absolute pointlessness of judging you just immediately feel what it is to be judged and how pointless it is for 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 me to to judge this other person because you see it can go on forever there's no limit to it you can always find a better meditator you can always <laughs> you can always find someone who's better at something than you you know and so to to Im use the imagination that way and uh, and just see uh, see the futility of it you know the pointlessness of it Another little uh, tactic that I'm quite fond of is, um, to, again, to use the imagination and imagine, okay, this person, whatever it is, they're, they're, I'm judging them, they're annoying me, or whatever. And imagine that, imagine that the world, that I had the power to have everyone exactly how I wanted, how, everything exactly how I wanted it to be everyone and everything, that I actually had that power. Then, then to actually think, would I really even want to live in that kind of world? How, how sterile, how tight, how small, where, you know, there's something about, um, there's some mystery about the uniqueness, about the, u the, the there's a whole, um, There's a radical diversity, what I think I said the other day, a radical diversity in the universe. Would I really want to make the universe, the mysterious, wonderful universe, conform to how my small mind wants it to be? Would that really be... And at first we think, uh, yeah. <laughs> but stay with it for a while, and you realize, hmm, actually, maybe, maybe not such a good idea. So even in the things that annoy us, can we find this sense of mystery and beauty? I think I said the other day, the universe is not set up to please me. And, and in a way, you know, thank goodness, it's, it's not. <laughs> uh, it would be a terrible universe if it was set up to please me. <laughs> um, okay, so those are some of the, uh, in a way, little tricks. But even then, uh, judging is such a strong habit, such a condition of the mind, that even then sometimes that's not enough. So in a way we need to bring in the, 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 big, the big guns, you know, the big armor. And the first one is the metta, the metta practice. Okay. So it can seem, especially at the beginning uh, of metta practice, like, well, you know, not much is really happening here, you know. Uh, where the Buddha says, drop by drop, and the bucket is filled. Drop by drop, and the bucket is filled. So it's like that with metta. We have a, a long, you know, lifetime habit of judging. Lifetime habit of judging. And with the metta practice, we're making a new habit. We're letting go of one habit, of judging ourselves, judging others. And we're in its place, putting a new habit, a beautiful habit, a non-judgmental habit. We're reconditioning the mind. The mind is conditioned. That's what the mind is. It is conditions. Conditions coming together. And we, we have a say in that conditioning of the mind. We can 
take it out of its groove and, and run it along a, a happier, better, uh, more beautiful groove. And this reconditioning of the mind, the Buddha put a lot of emphasis on it. Putting effort into uh, developing what is beautiful, cultivating what is beautiful, and letting go of what is not so beautiful. And so, uh, like we said the other day with the metta practice, to see what we're doing. We're planting seeds with, with the metta practice. So it might feel like there's nothing happening, but like the farmer plants the seeds, and the farmer has faith, has faith in the seed, and he has faith in nature. He plants a seed, and plants a seed, and plants a seed. And that's what happens when we do the phrases with the metta. And the farmer knows, if I plant enough seeds, nature takes care of the rest and up comes, up comes the tree, up comes the, the, uh, the crop, the, the fruit. So metta over time is an extremely powerful practice. It may not feel that way yet, but it's extremely powerful. And there is sometimes in, in, maybe not so much recently, but there was in the insight meditation tradition, in some Buddhist traditions, viewing metta, it's a baby practice, you know, it's for uh, but I don't think it's a baby practice at all. I think it's a really uh, strong, powerful practice. So judgment has this, this self wrapped up in it. <coughs> we have to be quite gentle with that in the sense that part of the condition of being human, part of the condition of consciousness, very deep conditioning, is to see things in terms of self. So, something happens, I am such and such, a per- I am like this person, I am a bad person, I am an angry person, I am whatever, or you are. And to see in terms of I and you, very deeply conditioned in consciousness, much deeper uh, even than <coughs> You know, we might think, oh, it's Western society, it's so competitive and everything. It's actually deeper than, than uh, cultural conditioning. It's something that goes with, with the human condition. <coughs> and to realize that, it's, it's bound up with the human condition. It's part of ignorance. It's part of the human condition. So to be quite uh, spacious and patient with the existence of judgment, in a way. So we can challenge it, but then to judge the fact that there's judging, we, <laughs> you know, it's just going to cycle, and it's, it's just misery, it's just misery. So right from the beginning, you have to accept uh, it's human to judge. It's, it's, like I said, it's wrapped up in the nature of consciousness, actually. So it's so wrapped up that uh, even when we have the best intentions uh, to work on ourselves in, in ways to get free and uh, to, be, to see clearly, even with the best intentions, the judgment uh, it still it still comes in, and often in maybe a little bit hidden ways. So a little while ago, I was teaching somewhere, and a person asked. Uh, he was saying something like when I meditate I just feel re- I feel really stuck I feel like there's a very some old conditioning that's stuck there and I must be really afraid of it moving through and he, w- he this, this is he said yeah there's, I'm just really stuck there's, I can sense there's something old and I'm, I'm afraid of it moving through and it was quite interesting to spending a little time talking to him because I sense something, and then when I asked him, well, what actually is the experience? What actually is the experience? At first he didn't know what I was talking about. He said, no, I, I'm stuck, and, th- and there's this fear. I know it's something new coming, and I'm af- afraid of the new and everything. And well, then he finally understood. I said, no, what's the experience? I mean, do you feel a tightness here? Or do you, you know, what's the... And he said, oh, yeah, well, I guess there's some sensations of, like, pressure in my chest, and, and my belly feels a little tight. And I said, well, can, can it just be that? Can you just be with the experience and see that the rest of it, I am stuck, I am, there is something old coming up and through that I don't know what it is, and I am afraid of opening, all that 
is a view. It's a view. And uh, it's an interpretation of what's going on. But the actual experience was just some pressure and, and a little bit of tightness. And, he, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way that freed him up to, to actually experience what's going on and allow it to move how it is. Uh, in a way, there's a lot of skill in being flexible with one's view of what's going on. So sometimes the most appropriate thing is actually just to go to really the, the simplest possible uh, experience of what's going on. I feel some tightness, I feel heavy, I feel pressure or whatever, and where is it in the body? E oftentimes that's the most skillful because we tend to overcomplicate, make a story, make an interpretation, then say I am Boom, and then we give it this stamp, and we put ourselves in a little cage, and then and then we're in this cage, and, <laughs> and, and we're stuck there. And we made it, we made it. So oftentimes, uh, it's it's more skillful to go to just what's the bare experience, actually. Can I just see? Okay, that's my interpretation. I just I just let that be and see what the experience is. But sometimes, an interpretation is useful. It's it's useful to say okay, this is actually something coming th up from the past and I do feel afraid and whatever. The really mature skill, let's say, the, the thing that comes with a lot of practice is feeling free. Sometimes I just go to the basic experience, sometimes I take the view of self, sometimes I have another view, and there's a kind of, you realize actually they're all just, they're all just interpretations, they're all just views. And because you realize they're just views, you have it's like you have the key to the cage it's just you can go in there and you can unlock it and walk out it's just it's just a tool a way of looking we can pick up a view an interpretation of what's going on and we can put it down and that's that's where a lot of freedom is picking up and putting it down so I was talking with a good friend a, uh, a few weeks ago, and and she had uh, lived in India for seven years and spent most of her time in India practicing meditation, helping uh, to manage meditation retreats like Sampan Yuha doing, uh, just really involved in the Dharma, all not all the time, but a lot of it for seven years, and at a certain point. Uh, she realized that there were some things that she felt weren't being addressed by that kind of lifestyle and she decided to come back to the West and deal, and deal with certain things like around money and other stuff. And then having got back to the West, and I think she's been back for a couple of years now, uh, she, she felt like where she thought she was in her practice in India, which was like quite she felt very free, apart from a few little issues. She felt very free and very flowing. When she came back to the West, after a little time, she realized, oh, I wasn't quite where I thought I was. And <laughs> again, though, what, when we were talking, I was, I was um, it touched me, her w willingness to be humble and honest. You know, actually, this is where I am. Let me be honest. Let me be honest about the challenges that I'm facing, really how free I really feel. And there's something really beautiful about that, the honesty and the humility. But still, still interpreting where I am, where I am on this, you know, continuum from complete misery to absolute enlightenment or whatever where I am. What if, uh, and we were talking about it, what if it's just, this is what's going on now. This is the pattern or whatever that's manifesting. And I was actually taken out of it. The I was taken out of it. And this um, defining or measuring of oneself on a scale was actually just dropped. Just dropped. And it's like, this is, this is what feels difficult right now. This is a pattern I notice. This is a, 
uh, a constriction I notice, or this is a fear I notice. What if the measurement was taken out? So it, it's you know both these instances coming from really honest, uh, beautiful willingness, to, you know, and desire to open and to ask questions and to and to go free. But still, the, s the self will f you know, find its way there. Okay. Burrows in and and then uh, and, and, and sits there and starts to control everything. So the Buddha says, uh, like I said this morning, see the feeling in the feeling, see also the Dharma in the Dharma. I mean, you see, see the the quality in the quality. If fear is here, it's just fear is here. If anger is here, it's anger is here. If uh, joy is here, it's joy is here, or love is here, it's love is here. It's not I am so far along the path, or I am an angry person or a fearful person. Can it just be seeing the quality in the quality, seeing the, the fact in the fact, and the self just... You know. So, a little while ago also at Gaia House, talking to uh, two, two retreatants there, and they were had been there for quite a while, and were beginning to be quite sensitive to what kind of little impulses and thoughts uh, were just arising, going through their mind. And it was funny because it happened at the same time for both of them. Beginning to be aware of uh, thoughts of unkindness, little intentions of unkindness, of wanting to hurt, um, either destroying you know, little animals, you know, or or uh, destructive towards oneself in some way, and just beginning to be aware of this. And then so quickly the self-view comes in. Oh, actually now, now I've discovered the truth. I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and this, and we think this is, this is it, right. This is what, what, what has been revealed to me in meditation. And the self-view comes so quickly and, and uh, solidifies around what we see there. And then what happens, we begin to fear ourselves. Oh, what, what else am I going to see? <laughs> or we fear our past. Maybe there's something in the past that's lurking there, waiting to come up. So it's actually, and, and this is something I've experienced very strongly uh, many years ago in my practice, so much attunement to this what was negative and almost an obsession with it that it felt like I think there's a monster inside <laughs> and you know it's like there's some evil thing inside and it's you know I've got to be really careful and uh, what enormous pain what enormous pain from that to feel like we're actually scared of looking inside because we might see our badness or our unworthiness or something and then we fix this definition of ourselves. Uh, terrible pain people people go through with this, and and some people last a lifetime. You know, can really be stuck in that way of seeing. So when we become afraid, or if we become afraid, that very fear then builds the whole thing. The very fear starts giving this imaginary monster inside, or, or a bad person or whatever, it starts giving it a substance, giving it a sense of solidity. The fear is feeding it, it's, it's adding, it's like building this thing. So can we instead see, um, what I was talking about with these two retreatants, actually, it's just a thought. It was just a thought that came up. And when, when they practiced a little bit, uh, and one person just sort of discovered it themselves, and the other person kind of needed a little suggestion, but it was actually, there's just this moment, and a thought kind of arises out of nowhere. Can we actually begin to see our thinking process in a different way? Thoughts appear out of nowhere. They just come out of nowhere. They arise and they pass. They're so quick, and what is a thought anyway? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. 
can we get this sense that actually there are thoughts arising out of nowhere and actually disappearing back into nowhere? Arising and disappearing out of nowhere. If we can begin to see that way, uh, the self has gone out of it. The self view has gone out of it, or begins to go out of it. So actually, what we what we come to, what we realize, is that it's not so important whether negative thoughts or horrible thoughts or ugly thoughts uh, arise or not. The fact of their coming up is actually virtually irrelevant. What does matter is the view we have of them. The view we have of them. Are we defining ourselves because of a thought has arisen out of nowhere and then disappeared back into nowhere and then we make a definition. Whether we do that or not is much more important than the presence of the thought or the beauty or the ugliness of the thought. So also how we view them and our response to them. So certainly a thought comes up, I want to uh, murder someone that I, you know, whatever. Now obviously we don't act on that. So uh, it's it's clear what a harmful action is, and we refrain from that. We don't do that. Uh, but and similarly with speech, you know, you might feel like telling a person exactly uh, how much of an idiot they are, <laughs> but may not be the you know probably is not the most helpful or wisest thing. So there's there's again there's a discernment about action. What actually is helpful? But the presence of the thought is not a problem. It's not a problem if the view of it is right and if the response is right. This is a practice, okay? It's not that you suddenly hear this and then right, okay, uh, done, next, next. Uh, it's really a practice, which means it's gradual. It means it's gradual and it takes time for, I think, almost everyone I've ever talked to. Also, the thing about it being a practice is like when you practice uh, any skill, you start with the easy things first. So don't, you know, not to wait to try to try this until, you know, you have murderous thoughts or, or completely engulfed in self-hate. Uh, you know, oh, I need to go shopping for bread. That's a thought. Can we see that? It's just arising out of nowhere and just going back into nowhere. Sometimes the space of the awareness in the meditation gives gives that more the sense of things just coming out of nowhere and going back into nowhere. And there can be a little space around thought. We have practice around thoughts that we don't really care about anyway. And then slowly, slowly we're actually able to use this uh, reflection on thoughts that are really potentially quite harmful, quite difficult. But to practice with the easy stuff first. When we let go of negative judgment, uh, like I am useless, I am a failure, whatever it is, or you are, uh, let's talk about I for now. When we when we let go of the negative, uh, we sometimes think, oh, well then I'd, I'll be left with actually I'm fantastic, and, uh, I'm <laughs> you know, and we think I'm gonna be nice, you know. Actually, it's like uh, one teacher says, you can't chop off the left-hand side of a stick. If you, ch if you have a stick, you have left and right, you say, I'm going to get rid of the left because I don't like left. I don't like negative opinions of myself. I only want positive opinions. So I'll chop the left-hand side off. <laughs> and then you're left with a, sm a smaller stick, but of course it's got a left and a right. And then you have to chop that off. <laughs> You cannot get rid of left and right. Similar with opinions, judgments of ourselves. Actually, you have to let go of the whole package. So, it's not that uh, we let go of the negative identity. We also let go of the positive. Also let go of the positive. So some, uh, some 
like it's quite popular in say the new age movement using affirmations you know, I am a good person I am uh, uh, even I am uh, beautiful I'm wealthy you know that kind of thing uh, that that can be really useful for some people but it has a real limit because whenever you feed the positive you're actually feeding the negative as well in a hidden way you're feeding the negative whenever there is a positive whenever there's a right hand side it has to be a left hand side so the way to freedom is actually to let go of all, I- all identifying with any kind of opinion about how I am, any kind of measurement or defining of how I am. And then there's freedom, there's freedom. We're just not so infatuated with this whole measuring ourselves business. So. Is it possible to cultivate uh, gradually in meditation, using the mindfulness, using the silence, a sense, an awareness, a way of looking that it's just a thought, it's just an impulse, just an intention that's come up. It's come up out of nowhere. So sometimes if there's quite some spaciousness, like this is where the listening can be quite useful, there's a sense of space, sounds arise out of nowhere, they disappear and then back into nowhere. Thoughts are like that. Uh, one teacher uses the image, it's like in the night sky and fireworks, just appearing in the night sky, very vivid, and then they disappear, and blackness, and then they appear, and they disappear. Can we gradually cultivate that? You see, a thought is, it's not me, it's not who I am, it's not mine, it's just happening. So that's one possibility for cultivation. Second possibility is to, in a way, look and see a bit of a bigger picture of a situation. So if I feel in, in some moment I said something stupid, or I said something I regret, or I did something that I thought was stupid, or I uh, did something and I felt like, well, oh, I could have, didn't do that very well. Can I, instead of making a conclusion about myself, can I see what were all the conditions, the whole uh, array of conditions, inner and outer, that, that led to that action or those actions? So maybe I was tired. Maybe there was fear around. Maybe there was a lot of difficult stuff in the environment, uh, the situation, I don't know, it could be anything. Um, can I look, instead of in terms of self, can I look in terms of all the conditions that make, that make a moment? Because it's the conditions that make something. If I'm really tired, I don't usually, the way I do something, it, it suffers a little bit. Not always, but, but it, it could suffer. If there's a lot of fear, how that cramps. If there's a lot of pressure from outside that someone else is putting on us, that's feeding, it's the conditions feeding a moment. But we tend not to see that. Human beings have this habit of seeing everything in terms of self. No, it didn't work out because I was, I was rubbish, or you were rubbish. Can we see that there's, there's, a, there's a whole web of conditions? And this can be for, for something that's been going on for, you know, not just in a moment, but, you know, the way a relationship is. So over years, and we tend to blame ourselves or blame the other person, often that happens, you know, very common when a relationship ends, or there's difficulty. And not to see all the, all the web of conditions that feed how, how that happened, how it, what prevented it from working so well. So we see this in, in ourselves, for ourselves, and we see it in others, when we judge ourselves and when we judge others. And again, this is a practice, because the, ha- the other habit of judgment is so strong, so we really need to practice this. It's really, really, really worthwhile making that shift. Really practicing seeing in terms of conditions rather than in terms of self. It's so worthwhile. And of course it still means we still have responsibility for our action. It's not, oh, I can just blame the conditions. Of course we still have responsibility.
human beings, I mean, what, one of the things that the Buddha said, at a very deep level, human beings, we, we all have within us three seeds uh, that are three seeds that are not so helpful. The seed of greed, the seed of aversion, of anger, of hatred, <coughs> and the seed of misunderstanding, of delusion, of ignorance. And that is the human condition. That is the human condition. That's part of what goes into being human. It's not the whole story, but it's part of what goes into being human. And just to see that, so again, instead of seeing self, you see, this is part of the human condition. They were like this because those seeds were, were acting. That's all. And it just takes a moment of reflection to think, actually, I've done something pretty similar. Or I've acted, uh, maybe if I haven't been that extreme, if I've never murdered anyone. I, I have acted out of anger. I have acted even out of hatred in my life. And you know, just to see that I've, I've done that too. Sometimes life has a way of showing us. So we judge someone for something, and we feel like this, and then a little time goes by and we do exactly the same thing. You know, exactly the same. And it's just... You know. This... What I, what I really want to say is that it's... It can feel like the, the habit of judgment is so deep and so almost unstoppable but I, I can tell you that it's absolutely possible that it ends that it really really ends and uh, it can be and it's totally possible that huge chunks huge pieces the majority even of the mountain of judgment just crumbles sometimes suddenly really quite suddenly in the space of you know, a few weeks even, just goes. Or it might happen in a much more gradual way. Uh, or both, both different times. But it's absolutely possible, and it's possible for everyone in this room, this is a possibility for human beings to really move beyond judgment. Really, 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 not just the theory, really. I remember for me, uh, in fact, I. I if I say th this, I feel happened in, in uh, is happening in, in two ways, in in the sudden way, you know, sometimes just crumbling, and other parts quite interesting. Uh, maybe a sudden shift or whatever, and but the habit remained in the habit of those kind of thoughts. So something would happen, and, and the thought would still come up, "Oh, you idiot, Rob!" But it was coming up completely free of any charge, com just like empty words, no power, no energy to it, no meaning. It was just the, the force of habit, of judgment, was so strong in the, in the mind, in the brain, that it was still coming up, but it had lost all its power, completely lost its power. And then over time, even those thoughts just stopped. They had been uh, sucked dry, and they just stopped coming. They just they don't, don't arise. It's like we don't believe them. We don't believe them. They just th there's no movement to believe them. So may the distinction between judgment and discernment. Judgment when when it's all about self or other, and discernment that's more about seeing just what's what's helpful, what's not. Actually, at really deep levels of practice, even the discernment it goes, one goes beyond even the discernment. So, I want to read you something. Uh, it's from the third Zen patriarch. It's quite well known uh, and, and sort of much loved. It's from a very long poem, just the first four little, little parts of it. It's um, third Zen patriarch, it's called Faith, Faith in Mind verses on the faith and mind. And it's one of these things that you can revisit it over and over. And it's very beautiful and really worth reading. 
and you can revisit over and over and discover levels of meaning every time one, one, one or at different different stages of one's journey. So I just read it. It says the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, then hold no opinions for or against anything. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. When the deep nature of things is not understood, the mind's essential peace is disturbed to no avail. The way is perfect like vast space. Nothing is lacking and nothing is in excess. Indeed, it is due to our choosing to accept or reject that we do not see the true nature of things. So I, f I find that very beautiful and very moving and sometimes it's like even if we don't understand it, I mean, to me there's something quite, we, we hear the, 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 either the shout or the whisper of truth there. In the, uh, so like I said, there's, I just want to finish up on this move, not going into too much detail, there's levels that we can understand there, so what it's pointing to is even letting go of discernment, even the choice between uh, between love and anger, between calmness and uh, agitation, between concentration and distraction, between mindfulness and non-mindfulness. Even letting go of that kind of what we know is good. What we call non-duality. Non-duality. Not, not making a polarity out of things. Now, like I said, there are many levels at which this can be understood and many ways one can go into this. But sometimes there can be a sense that the mindfulness is there, the awareness is there, and everything is arising and passing, arising and passing in awareness. Thoughts, body sensations, emotions, judgments, whatever it is. And everything arises in the space of awareness and disappears, and the awareness remains like space, like vast space in which everything happens. So sometimes this is why the listening can be very useful to get begin to get a sense of this. Sometimes it goes even deeper and things themselves seem to be in the same sort of substance as awareness. But from the point of view of awareness, everything's the same. It's all the same. It's just stuff happening in this big space, just arising and passing. Now, that's not an ultimate view. It's not the ultimate truth. It's still a view, but can be extremely skillful if we begin to get, you know, gradually in practice, a sense of that. Begin to get a sense of that. There's a tremendous amount of freedom there. A tremendous amount of freedom. Free and and with it comes a very deep freedom from, from judging, from the judging mind. I think I'll actually stop there for this evening. Or shall we have a minute or two of quiet together?
all beings be free of judgment. May all beings live in wisdom and love. May all beings realize their freedom. Thank you for listening. 